was sie so erlebt hat. Und sie wird uns jetzt auf jeden Fall davon erzählen. We are very curious to hear how you got so popular. <laughs> All right, thank you. Enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Laura Decker. I'm now 23 years old. When I was 14, I decided to sail around the world on my own. I was 16 when I successfully finished that journey, so that may be the youngest person to ever do such a thing. <laughs> now today I want to tell you a little bit about that journey, but I also want to tell you about my new projects. Um, I'm just going to start with a short video so you get a bit of an idea of what my trip looked like and how it was out there, so enjoy that.
at this age? Well, since that's a good question, I'm going to try to answer that. But to properly answer it, I need to back up a few years. So, all right, it works. <laughs> so my dad started building boats when he was very young. When he was in his early 20s, he finished building a 12-meter yacht. He then met my mom, and they sailed around the world. And halfway around the world, I was born. So they started from Holland, I was born in New Zealand. From that moment on, I always joined this crew on their boat. We sailed from New Zealand to Australia to Indonesia, and of course, along the way they worked, but they also really went into everything and explored the cultures. I tried to help, I don't think it was very helpful, <laughs> but I'm very curious and I love learning from a young age already. So we went into the tribes, we sailed for about four or five more years. But then my younger sister Kim was also born, and my dad decided the boat was getting too small and we needed a bigger boat for the family. So we went back to Holland and he started building another boat, a much bigger boat, 22 meters. And sadly, also around uh, when I was six, my uh, parents divorced, and I decided I wanted to stay with my dad. Because I love boats, I love sailing. Um, my sister then automatically went to my mom, so I grew up with my dad, who was building this boat. Now, by now it looks like this, it's almost finished, <laughs> um, just needs booms and gaffs and sails and then he plans to go off into the Pacific again. So you can imagine, I got quite inspired to build my own little boat. When I was six I built this. It may not look like much, but this is actually where my dreams began. Um, I built this and I was very proud of it and I remember crossing the river for the first time where we lived in Holland and I was so excited and it was like this big adventure to cross this river um, and somehow the, the feeling of this always I had the same feeling when I left for my journey um, it always stayed the same just my my dreams and my adventures got bigger so from there on, I went into an optimist, into a mirror, I upgraded my boats very quickly. And from the age when I was about eight, I think I had this dream that one day I wanted to sail around the world. I wanted to be just like my parents and go around the world. I had no idea how I was going to do it, or where, or when, or any details. I just knew I wanted to do it. And my dad said I would need a lot of experience, and money, and a boat, and so I figured, okay, I'll start with it, because why would I wait with that? I can prepare now. So I found myself jobs that I could do when I was eight, which isn't a whole lot, but there's things you can do, like cleaning up shops, and um, delivering newspapers. At some stage, uh, I bought myself a unicycle for my first and earned money. That was actually a very good investment, because with that I would perform into, uh, in all the cities where I was. Um, together with my dog, I had a performance, and that earned quite well. So then when I was 11 years old, I could buy this boat. And together with my dog, I sailed around the whole of Holland in my summer holidays. Um, then when I was 12, I would also sail to the Bada Zee, to the islands, uh, a little bit on the North Sea. So then by the time I was 13, I was kind of, kind of bored. I had seen Holland, I would sailed around, I wanted to go somewhere else. And I figured England was a great next step. So in a, a school holiday, I prepared my boat and I left off to England, um, but I thought it was a very good idea to not tell anybody about it, because they would probably not agree with a 13-year-old sailing to England. Um, I was probably right about that, so that was a good thing, except for maybe not telling your parents about it either is not a really smart thing. Anyhow, <laughs> I sailed to England. I had pretty horrid conditions, it was super foggy and I don't know if any of you have sailed in the channel and in the North Sea. It's not a nice piece of water to sail in. It's grubby, there's lots of ships and if there's fog, it's not nice. Especially this boat didn't have a radar, I had a GPS and my paper charts and I had this map of like sound signals that boats make when, um, when you're in very thick fog. So I was sitting there listening to all the sound signals going Hey, there's a fishing boat, and there's a container ship, and there's an oil rig, and trying to navigate through all these things. And um, it actually went surprisingly well. <laughs> um, I was well prepared, and even though I was kind of scared, I got to England as well. I was there for a few days, and then the police picked me up. Uh, but oh well, that's another part of the story. Actually, my dad had to come to England to pick me up from the police station, and then said, well, you sailed the boat here, so you might as well sail it back to Holland. <laughs> So I did. I sailed the boat back to Holland. And 
that's the moment that I thought, why don't I just sail around the world now? I have a boat. I could sail up and down to England a hundred times, or I could put all that distance behind each other, and I'll be in Southern Europe already. So I didn't really see a big deal or a point in it. Um, sadly, there were a lot of other people who did. Uh, so after I'd convinced my parents that I could do it, I had to convince the courts and the childcare. And um, Holland kind of made a really big deal out of it. Um, some of you might have gotten a piece of that as well. It wasn't very pretty. Um, it was just this one day uh, I said I want to sail around the world. And the next day, I was this unfamous girl that was just in the media everywhere and was criticized by what felt to me like the whole world was telling me I shouldn't do it and I couldn't do it and it was the worst idea and the, uh, my parents, the rights for me, they were taken off them by the judge. So then the following year we spent trying to get the rights back that they could actually decide things for me again. I was put under childcare. I couldn't do anything, I couldn't leave Holland. Um, it was a very crazy, gnarly year. Um, they also decided that my little boat that I had was too small, and needed a bigger boat. So I sold that one, found this one, and together with my dad I fixed it up. So actually everything I knew at that stage I learned from my dad, from engines, to fixing boats, to sailing, navigating, and um, this is Guppy. This is the boat that I ended up sailing around the world in. She's 12 meters in a catch, which I really liked. I'm not very big, so I liked small boats, but oh well. I had some judges that didn't know anything about boats and just thought it's all about the size. So I had to suddenly deal with a much bigger boat. So I'm glad it was a catch anyway, because then the sails are comparatively a little bit smaller. That was a big learning curve for me, because of course I had sailed quite a bit, but then crossing an Atlantic and getting into squalls and storms and cooking on board and doing everything on the boat um, was a challenge, especially if the cooking itself was already a challenge and now I had to do it while riding a roller coaster. So that didn't always go well. Sometimes I flew with my ravioli through the boat um, and then decided that maybe I wouldn't have dinner that day. <laughs> But, um, and eventually I think I ended up just eating pasta and pancakes because I just couldn't really make anything else. You can live on that for quite a while, I found out. But after about two months, you start feeling really kind of you need something else. So the main reason I wanted to sail around the world was that I wanted to, to see the world. I wanted to get to know other cultures and other people. So I actually spent a lot of time uh, going inland and uh, anchoring, going to different islands and, and just getting to know the locals. And this was a very special experience for me. I learned a lot from these people. Because I, I, was, I grew up in Holland most of the time. It's a very materialistic world. And, um, and these people, they didn't have anything. You know, I, I got to know people that live in little huts. And um, I remember quite well, I had it a few times. So at one time I talked to a woman and I said, oh, wouldn't you want to live in a bigger house, in another place, have some more stuff? And she really kind of angrily answered me and said, why do you people always think that we need more stuff? Um, she said, we have everything. We have a roof above our heads, we have food from the trees, we have water, and we have our family with us, which is a super important thing for them. And for me, that was kind of this realization moment that, yeah, we really don't need stuff to be happy. These people were super happy. In fact, I think they were happier than most of the people I see in Europe, that I see here. They were just actually content with what they had. So, I like that. And on the boat, I experienced that a lot as well. It was a very simple boat. Um, I didn't have a fridge, I didn't have a shower, I didn't have a water maker, uh, no internet or satellite or anything like that. And I loved it. I learned to really love it. And I appreciate things, even today, I'm still so happy when I'm under a warm shower or when I have an ice cube in my drink, I still think, oh wow, this is amazing, that I can have this. So that's, that's really something very special that this trip has taught me, to just be happy with what I've got. Of course, I also saw lots of animals, sadly not as many as I wished I'd see. My parents said they saw dolphins almost every day, I definitely didn't, so that it's sad to realize it has cost them so much less. So I went through the Panama Canal, stopped in the Galapagos briefly, where I had an uninvited visitor on the boat. 
I woke up in the middle of the night to check my anchor, and suddenly there was this big flag blob lying in the cockpit, and I kind of thought, what is this? Um, it growled at me, it wasn't very friendly. Um, after a brief conversation, I decided that it was okay there, and I wouldn't chase it off because it had sharp teeth. So it actually slept there the whole night. It's kind of cute. And then they left in the morning, Mr. Sea Lion. So from the Galapagos, I went to the Marquesas and really into the Pacific Islands. And I love those islands and I really love the people as well. They were so friendly and so warm and so welcoming. Um, I remember also one time I had a big hole in my foot because I fell in the boat during a storm. Um, and I was very afraid that it would get infected. And then this, this family picked me up and the woman just took me to her house every day for like a week and took care of my foot and she mandated it in um, I was super thankful and I was trying to give her something and to say thanks. And somehow she, they, they didn't want it. They were even kind of offended that I tried to give them something. And later on I spoke to somebody who spoke more English and that I could actually communicate with. And he said, you know, for them their vision is if you give something and you get something back straight away, then the gift of giving is gone. And I thought that was very beautiful because often we give something as a gift, but then if we never get anything back from that person, we think, hmm, it's not nice. You know, I'm giving this person a gift, and I'm not getting anything back. And it's a very, yeah, human way of thinking, I think. Um, but these people, they just didn't have that at all. They really just wanted to give. And I thought that was very beautiful. Oh, lessons that I really hope I will never ever forget. I don't think I will. So then I went to Australia. There the money was kind of getting very low. I decided to not have any big financial sponsors and just have stuff sponsored here. Um, so then uh, I had to find a cheap way to get the boat out of the water, which luckily there's like a seven meter tide in Darwin, so I went up on the high tide and put the boat on the beach and then uh, scrubbed it and did the maintenance. Luckily, uh, yeah, I had a lot of maintenance, so I had to go up and down quite a lot of times, but it saved a good amount of money. And then I got into the Indian Ocean. I decided to sail from Australia straight to South Africa, which is like 6,000 miles. It took me 48 days. And it was a very tough ocean weather-wise. It started with two weeks of no wind. This is also where I decided that I hate no wind a lot more than uh, storms, because if there's no wind, then generally there's a big swell still like this. And you're just rolling around the whole day things actually break or chafe through more than they do in a storm. And it takes so long. After two weeks, I was just, I was so over it. I couldn't sleep and things were chafing through and it was driving me insane. So I was very happy when I got the first storm. Um, I did get knocked down and had lots of water inside, but uh, I was still kind of happy that we were at least going somewhere. <laughs> um, luckily it also rained a lot because I didn't have a water maker and just 150 liters of water. I also had a little friend on the boat, uh, although we didn't become very good friends. Um, he looks pretty grumpy, as you can see. I think he was very tired, but he stayed for about a week on the boat, and I tried to feed him and do stuff, but he didn't, uh, he didn't really like it. He actually gave me a very nasty present when he left. All the white stuff is from Messi, as I call the bird. It took me about two days to figure out why my batteries weren't charging anymore. Birds and me didn't get a very good relation while sailing. They always did this kind of stuff to me. Huh. Uh, somehow the clicker isn't working anymore. Oh, well, there we go. All right. So then I got to South Africa. That's actually where I got the biggest storm of all, uh, especially because of the waves and the current going into each other. You get very uh, dangerous sea situations. And there was a situation where my wind vane could not steer the boat anymore, and I had to hand steer down the waves. And after about a few hours, I was so tired that I just thought I couldn't keep going anymore. It was cold, the water was like seven degrees, and it was coming over all the time, and I was just tired, and I wanted to eat something. Um, but, but I really couldn't leave the wheel. Uh, the waves were just too steep, and I couldn't do anything. So I had to keep steering, and I just thought, all right, just, just one more wave, just one more wave. And I kind of kept thinking this. And then somehow my body just went into like survival mode. Which is a crazy thing, I, I realized how much a human body is actually capable of doing. Because after a few hours, I literally thought I couldn't do it anymore. But I steered for another, another day, if not one and a half days. 
uh, until I got to Cape Town safely. So the point where you think I can't do anymore and the point where your body really gives up that I didn't find out, but it, it lays so much further. We're capable of so much more than we think of. That was amazing to, uh, to go through that. Then from South Africa, I sailed straight back to the Caribbean. That's kind of where my or, uh, official arrival point is. I found it a strange, strange thing because my whole life up until that point, I had dreamt about sailing around the world and then suddenly it was over. Um, but actually my point was that I wanted to see the world and I wanted to go through storms and through calms and I had already done kind of everything I wanted when I was in South Africa. So in a way it didn't feel like the end of a dream at all. In fact it felt like the beginning of my life because I, I was so thankful for all the experiences and all the things that I learned along the way that I, I thought okay this is amazing now I can really go into the world and do something with it. Um, I wasn't. I get, often get the question whether I was lost or whether there was some, whether I didn't know what to do next. And I didn't have that at all. I was just super happy to keep going. Um, and I did actually. I sailed another half time around the world uh, to New Zealand because I really wanted to see where I was born. So I arrived there uh, at the end of 2012. I stayed there. I'm still living in New Zealand. Um, so this is the whole route together with uh, also the last little bit to New Zealand, or a little bit, well, all, all falls into perspective. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean now also seems like a small crossing, but, oh. Um, and then after the journey, I uh, decided to write a book about everything. Um, I've got a few puppies with me. I'm on a stand right across from the hall with my Laura Decker World Sailing Foundation, which is a new project I'm into. I did a little bit of electric, marine electrics in New Zealand. I um, also got my captain's license, so lots of deliveries for people. I also went back into the Pacific because I just didn't spend enough time there and I wanted to get to know the people better. Then all these experiences, all these things, I thought I want to do something with this. I want to somehow share it with the world and give it further, but especially to kids because I worked for a school in New Zealand for, for quite a while in the outdoor education. And I saw kids that, you know, were my age when I sailed around and they seemed so kind of lost. Like they didn't know where to go or what to do and they had no self-confidence. And um, I often thought, man, I wish I could put them on a boat and just send them through a storm because you learn so much from that. So then I thought, well, why don't I just do that? may seem like a bit of a crazy idea, but I started thinking about a boat that would be perfect to take kids on that have never ever sailed, or people that have never been on a boat. So I designed this boat, and now I'm looking for sponsors and people to actually get the boat built. Um, that's my next challenge. Then when the boat is there, I want to sail with kids. So really the target group is 13 to 17 years old. Um, then I have two trips, uh, the Europe tour, they can also join younger kids because they can go for weekends or days. It's easier to step on and off. But the Atlantic trip is really for the older kids, 13 to 17. They can either join one way or, or both ways. Um, and the aim is really to learn life skills. Uh, I don't want to teach sailing. That's up to, you know, some people love it and others hate it. Um, but these things that I learned from the journey I want to give them as well. So they have to do everything on the boat themselves. They need to sail, they need to cook, they need to navigate, they need to work together as a team. Um, and I really believe this will give them a huge stepping stone into their life because I see often kids like 16, 17, they're done with school and they, they know a lot. You know, there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of knowledge, but in schools they don't really teach you how to keep going with this. They have a set path for you, a set path of rules that you need to follow. But every human is an individual. Everybody has got their own dreams and their own goals. And when I was 13, people said, you can't do that because you're 13. Not, you can't do that because you don't have the skills or you can't do it. And I, I think that's where the problem is. They didn't look at me as an individual person. They looked at me as a 13 year old. And we often, as adults, do that, so that we look at a person because of their age or, their, or the box or the group that they're in, and we shouldn't do that. We should look at them as individuals, and especially kids have so much more capabilities 
then we give the credits for, I just wish I, yeah, I could, I could stimulate them, I could help them, just like my dad did for me. I'm super thankful that he did that. I believe it's very courageous. I think now that I'm a bit older, I understand better why people said I couldn't do it. You know, and I also see the kids that I work with, and I sometimes find myself thinking, oh, they're so small, I should help them. And then I'm like, oh no, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Um, so I understand it much better now, but I also know how I was raised and how that helped me in life. So I fully <laughs> stand behind this and yeah, I really want to do this. So this is the boat that I designed. It's very seaworthy, very stable. Um, it doesn't need to be fast, <laughs> but especially very comfortable for people that have just never been on a boat. Of course, uh, there's still a long way to go because this is as far as the boat is now. It's drawing, it's my ideas. Um, I've got a lot of great supporters and a sponsor already, um, but a lot more is needed. So uh, this year I'll focus on getting the funding and the sponsors, um, and then it will take about two years to build. So um, in three years, the boat will be there and we can actually go sailing. If you want to know more, I have a stand here on the Boat Düsseldorf right across from the hall, a stand F16. There's also some books and I'm more than happy to tell you all about what I'm doing right now. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Alright, one question, one last question maybe. What do you think is the best thing you can do against fear? Because my thinking was if people decide, if parents decide to let their go, kids go sailing, sailing with you, yeah. go sailing on their own, there's a lot of fear. Also to start new things, what do you think what can be helpful? That's a really great question. Um, it's something that actually I uh, learned from a very young age. I remember one situation very well where I was sailing the Optimist and my dad came alongside with a little rubber boat and just flipped the Optimist over but my, my feet were all wrecked in the sheets. So I was actually stuck underwater under the optimist. My, my dad had seen it, he had done it on purpose. Um, and I panicked because the situation was different, I didn't know what to do, and yeah, I just panicked. So dad jumped in, grabbed me out, and all was well, and was crying, and everything was, was a disaster. Anyway, he pulled me in the water and he said, this is why you shouldn't panic. Because if you panic, you lose control, you don't know what to do any, anymore. And panic is actually my, my biggest uh, yeah, enemy on the boats, especially if you're alone. So we practiced a lot to, to keep your mind in control. And uh, there were definitely moments that I was on the boat that I thought, oh, I don't know what to do, or this is crazy. Um, but then I just remembered, okay, take a step back, look at it from another perspective. Uh, sometimes I would just read or play the guitar to uh, calm my mind down. But uh, yeah, we just look at it rationally and kind of go through the, the positives and the negatives and what can I do. And, um, but it, it took a bit of practice and uh, my dad was a great help in that to just throw me into situations while I was a kid. So maybe everybody can support their kids a little more in this kind of being fearless. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you're, you know, that's the job of a, of a parent to teach your kids uh, and, and let them grow up so they're ready for the world and not to protect them because at some stage you're going to go and then if you protected them their whole life uh, then they will suddenly, you know, the shock will be much bigger. They will be protected and then suddenly they have to do everything alone. If you teach them as a parent to slowly ease into it, it will be much easier for them. But of course it, then you need to let go and you need to throw them into situations that are uncomfortable and you actually don't want to do. All right, thank you for being here and telling us your story, sharing with us your ideas and we hope that soon your boat will be built and ready for sailing to take off. Thank you. Thank you.